Amen. So, Lord, that's what we need, your love. And I pray that, uh, Lord, we would preach in your love this morning. I pray that you would guard me from my flesh, which makes me afraid so I don't speak, and my fear, which makes me yell sometimes. Pray that you guard me, that you would guard us, and that, Lord, your spirit, the spirit of God, who is love, would uh, preach this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, it's great to see you. Uh, this is our fourth message from First Peter. Uh, hopefully you remember that in our first message we saw that God made himself a tribal deity in order to make all of humanity his tribe. In our second message we talked about the paradigm shift called repentance which can turn the greatest loss into the greatest gain. And in the third message, we talked about the Adams family values. For we are each um, uh, members of the family of the Eschatos Adam, the king of the Jews and the king of creation. On June 7th, 1967, Israeli Brigade Commander Motegor made an announcement the Jews had waited to hear for some 2,000 years. Retaking this ground was important for a number of reasons. For one, it's where King Solomon built the first Jewish temple. After the Babylonians destroyed it, Zerubbabel laid the foundation stone for a second temple that was later expanded by King Herod. It fell at the hands of the Romans in 70 AD. When Commander Gore declared that the Temple Mount was back in Jewish hands, it rekindled hope for a long-awaited third temple. The Six-Day War was a miracle of biblical proportions and um, was a, um, a cataclysmic opening of a, of a new era for, for Israel and for the whole world. Rabbi Haim Richman of the Temple Institute is dedicated to rebuilding the Jewish Temple. He sees the time since the Six-Day War as a prophetic shift. The Institute shares a key connection to the battle for Jerusalem. Its founder, Rabbi Yisrael Ariel, served with the 55th Paratrooper Brigade that captured the Temple Mount. All of this means talk of rebuilding the Temple is no longer considered a fringe idea. Today, there is a lobby in the Knesset of how many members of Knesset that are constantly speaking about Jewish rights to pray on the Temple Mount. There are members of Knesset that actually talk about the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. Do you understand that 20 years ago, these people wouldn't have been given a moment on prime time television in Israel to say these things. They would have been laughed out. So, a few years ago, this was considered fringe? Zealots, lunatics, peculiar. Today, it's mainstream. One of those members is Yehuda Glick. Ten years ago, there was not a single member of Knesset who ascended the Temple Mount. Today, we have 20 of the Knesset members who are interested in ascending Temple Mount, praying on the Temple Mount, and are part in the battle for the redemption of the Temple Mount and for bringing the Temple Mount back into the center of the next, next step in the redemption process. Redemption. <laughs> that, that was a, that's a show called Jerusalem Dateline that aired on CBN about five weeks ago, September 26th. Seven days later, October 3rd, something like 300 Hamas militants broke out of the Gaza Strip and massacred 1,400 Jews in the most brutal of ways. And the world wonders what on earth could inspire such horror? How could one group of people treat another group of people you know, like sheep, just led to slaughter. The militants took something like, what, 240-some people hostage, you know, because you watch the news. But they would argue that Israel had taken 2.3 million people hostage ever since 1967 and that six-day war. The Gaza Strip contains 2.3 million people in 140 square miles of territory. The city limits of Denver, Colorado, including the airport, is 157 square miles, and it contains a population less than a third that of Gaza. So when Israel warns civilians to flee the bombs, it's, well, it is hard to imagine where they would go. 
Hamas claims that thousands of children have been blown to pieces in the last few days. And hopefully you've seen the pictures, and well, that's pretty easy to believe, isn't it? Last week while working out, I was listening to Biana Goladriga um, on uh, Global Public Square. She was interviewing the Iranian foreign minister, and she was really giving him a hard time when she said something like, how do you justify such unprovoked violence? And he said, well, it wasn't us. And then he went on to say something about an apartheid and genocide and violating the al Mosque at the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. And now if you don't think that, I'm starting to yell. <laughs> if you don't think that Bible study and theology make any practical difference? Before World War III begins, you really need to pay attention. <laughs> I also want to say that I did not plan the crisis in the Middle East to coincide with our little study in 1 Peter, but I think maybe God did. This is an extremely difficult and personal, it's a very personal topic for me, not because I find it confusing, Make no mistake, the politics in the Middle East, the politics are just extremely confusing, but I found that what Scripture says about Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple is just wonderfully straightforward. And what Scripture has to say about loving your neighbor is just so incredibly simple that I get physically nauseous watching the news. And pastors and rabbis and imams and politicians justify, obfuscate as children die. And I also get scared. Because I've been here before. At the end of 2004, I had been preaching through the gospel of Matthew in a really large church. For about two years, and we were approaching Matthew 21 and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, you know, just before he's crucified on Friday. It wasn't long after 9-11. We were at war in Iraq. The president had called it a crusade, and everyone was wondering, why do the Arabs hate us? I had read most of the Koran a few years before, and I found it incredibly boring, but terrifically terrifying in, in in places, yet the Muslims didn't hate everyone or every Christian country, at least not the way they hated us. So over Christmas, I decided just to go down to Barnes and Nobles and get some history books and read up on the history of Jerusalem and the state of Israel. When I got back in January of 2005, I preached a sermon titled, How to Enter Jerusalem. And then a second one uh, the following week titled The Holy Nation. And I hope you read them or listen to them on our website. I seriously think they may be two of the most prophetic sermons that I've ever preached and two of the three sermons for which I have been most maligned publicly and personally. In the first sermon, I simply and I believe fairly recounted the history of Jerusalem, the city of peace which, as you may know, is easily the bloodiest city in the history of the world. I talked about Adam, whom, according to legend, was formed on the rock on that mount. I talked about Melchizedek, king of righteousness and king of Jerusalem. Remember who came out and gave the bread and wine to Abram? I talked about Abraham and the almost sacrifice of his son Isaac on that rock, on that mount. I talked about David and how he took it from the Jebusites in the 10th century when it was a Canaanite fortress called Zion. I talked about the Babylonians who took it from the Jews in the 6th century BC, destroying the temple, sending the Jews into exile, as the prophet said would happen, before the king of Iran, that's wild, that is Persia, sent them back. I talked about the Greeks who took it in 332 BC. I talked about the Maccabean Jews who took it back in 167 BC and how violent they were. In 80 BC, the Sadducees crucified 800 Pharisees outside the city walls while they watched them as they hung on their crosses, slit the throats of their wives and their children. And I talked about Rome. In 63 BC, Rome took control. In 70 AD, they sacked the city and they desecrated the temple. In 135, they literally plowed it into the ground such that not one stone's left on another. What, you know, the Wailing Wall is actually the, 
It's actually the, what the retaining wall for Herod's temple. I talked about the Byzantine Christians who ruled uh, from the 4th to the 7th centuries. They talked about 745 A.D. when the city fell to Muslims. And it was ruled by various Muslim groups until 1099 when the first crusaders arrived at the city walls. I talked about July 15, 1099 when the crusaders breached the city wall and for three days they killed virtually every inhabitant. Muslim, Jew, and Christian. Raymond of Aguilares, one of the crusaders, wrote, What happened there? If I tell the truth, it will exceed your powers of belief. So let it suffice to say this much. At least that in the temple and porch of Solomon, which was the Dome of the Rock shrine, although he didn't realize it at the time, the porch of Solomon men rode in blood up to their knees and bridle reins. Crusader is a Latin word, and this is what it means. One who carries a cross. I talked about October 7th, 1187. It was the supposed anniversary of Muhammad's night journey when he is said to have ascended to heaven from the rock on the Temple Mount. It was on the anniversary of that day that the, that the Muslims retook the city. I really have no illusions about fundamentalist Islam. They're extremely fond of eternal conscious torment. They love that doctrine. And according to Wikipedia, there are at least still, there are still at least 10 Muslim countries where the penalty for apostasy, that is converting to another religion, is death. You can, I don't know if you can see that on this map, but, but you'll notice that some of those countries are U.S. allies. <laughs> well, Islam produces some insanely violent people. Nevertheless, under a variety of Islamic empires up until 1917, Jerusalem contained Muslims, Christians, and some Jews who much of the time lived in relative peace. And then I talked about the British who took the city from the Ottoman Turks in 1917 on December 9th, which happened to be the anniversary of Hanukkah that year. In 1915, there were about 39,000 Jews in, in, in Palestine, that, that is the land of Israel. Now the number is 7.2 million. I hope you can see how that would cause some problems for, for people. In 1922, according to the Jewish Virtual Library, 78% of the population of Palestine was Muslim, 10% Christian, and 11% Jewish. It's not like that now. The British made conflicting promises to the Jews and to the Arabs. The United Nations proposed a partition plan in 1948. Hitler had just undertaken the most horrific of gen genocides, in, as, of, as you know, which made the situation in Europe absolutely untenable. What were the Jews supposed to do? It was far too easy for the U.S. and Britain to say, go to Palestine and we'll help. Arab states went to war with Israel. Israel won and sent millions of Palestinians into exile. In 1967, with a preemptive strike to stop Arab aggression, Israel captured all of Palestine. That was in the Six-Day War. And Jerusalem, 868 years to the day after the Crusaders had first arrived at the city walls in 1099. Many say it's a miracle. Many others say, no, it's billions and billions of dollars in U.S. military aid. I, I shared this chart in the sermon from a book titled Jerusalem Besieged and said, this is a list of all the conquerors who ever entered Jerusalem except one. And yet we Christians claim that this conqueror not only conquered Jerusalem, he entered Jerusalem and conquered all things. And of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And yet he's not even on the list. For this is how he conquered. And then I showed a clip from the Passion of the Christ and read the account of Jesus entering the city on Palm Sunday in Matthew 21. You know, he entered on a donkey and referred to the city as his bride. 
And I pose this question. Could it be that we try to take the city in the one way that Jesus refused to take it? Or take her? And could it be that every time we try to take the city, we simply destroy the city? And could it be that the crusader who truly captures the city, builds the city, makes his home in the city, is not the one who crucifies, but the one who's crucified for all? The next week, I preached a message titled, The Holy Nation. And we asked the question, who is the holy nation? Who is Israel and who are the Jews? 18 years ago, on that Christmas break, I was really surprised to find that there have been many Orthodox Jews who claim that the nation state of Israel was absolutely not the holy nation. For they claim that only God, through the work of the Messiah, would bring the Jews into the land and establish the kingdom prophesied in the Old Testament. If we read the Proverbs, we realize that's describing something kind of different. I was also surprised that Zionism at the turn of the last century was largely a secular movement, not a religious one. One Orthodox Jew wrote this, apart from the Zionists, the only ones who consistently considered the Jews a race were the Nazis. And they only served to prove the stupidity and irrationality of racism. There was no way to prove racially whether a Mrs. Mueller or a Mr. Meyer were Jews or Aryans, the Nazi term for non-Jewish Germans. The only way to decide whether a person was Jewish was to trace the religious affiliation of the parents or grandparents. It's a bit shocking to read the law of return. You, you can Google it. It stipulates, Israel, Israel, a law in Israel, it stipulates that anyone with a Jewish grandparent can immigrate. It gets incredibly complicated, though, because, like, for instance, agnostics can be Jews according to the state, as I understand it, but usually not Christians. For supposedly, those Jews have converted to another religion. They call it a democracy, but through a, a system of racial designation, they ensure a Jewish majority. And, and having been there, I get that. I get why they, they would do that. I'm certainly not saying that Islamic countries are less tribal than the nation state of Israel, but it is this really challenging question to ask, well, what's, what, is, what is a Jew? In that message, I claim to be a Jew because my father's Yahweh. And my mother is the Jerusalem above. And my brother is Jesus. My husband is Jesus. My head, the head of my body, the body I am is Jesus. I'm even circumcised in Jesus. His blood flows through my veins. And according to the apostle Paul, my spirit has become one spirit with him, the king of the Jews. That's not replacement theology. That's biblical theology. I'm not replacing anyone, but like it or not, I'm grafted into the family tree. It turns out that some people didn't like that message, and especially that idea. But they weren't Muslims, and they weren't Jews, at least not according to the designation of the state of Israel. They were Christians, Christian Zionists. One man sent a letter to the pastors around town in the Anti-Defamation League stating that I was an anti-Semite and that the blood of the Jews was on my hands. I discovered that it wasn't just two groups fighting over the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. It was three. Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Zionist Christians. I hope you see that this is weird because Jesus is pretty clear about that old stone temple, a new Jerusalem uh, coming down and, and a new temple that he was, said he'd build in three days. But Christian Zionists usually have a map of the end times which requires a physical temple in Jerusalem. 
before the Antichrist can come so Jesus can also come so they get raptured while the rest of the world suffers tribulation including ethnic Jews who will then be endlessly tortured in fire or according to some maps they get a free pass because of their race. You see it just seems to me that some of us have confused a country in the Middle East with the promised seed of Abraham who is Jesus the Christ the king of the Jews. <laughs> It's incredibly complicated, but apparently it justifies for some not loving your neighbor and doing whatever it takes to get the people that call themselves the Jews a stone temple. Well, Because of all that commotion 18 years ago, some people in that church that was our church, that big church, they said, well, Peter, could, could we go on a trip to the Holy Land? And I said, well, yeah, sure, that would... That would be great. And so we did. 2006 we did. We even went to the Temple Institute where I took this picture of a golden menorah ready to be placed in the new stone temple built on the rock currently under the dome of the Dome of the Rock Mosque or Shrine. Well, like I said, for me this topic is personal and it's really painful. For that reason... And for one other reason, a reason that I have never, ever really talked about publicly. As you may have noticed, uh, part of my left eyebrow is missing. About 50 years ago, I was assaulted. I was hit in the head, and I almost died. I remember there was blood absolutely Everywhere. The doctor informed my parents that if it would have been a half inch closer to my temple, I would have died. I was hit in the head by someone who knew full well that I was a Christian and my father was a pastor. I was hit in the head with a bat by a Jew. Who was my best friend in fourth grade who locked himself in his room because he thought he'd accidentally killed me, his best friend. After he ran and got his mom, who was so freaked out that she ran across the street to get my mom, and then they came over uh, to me, lying on the grass, bleeding all over the place, all because I was saying too close to David Hart as he was playing baseball against the side of his house. Now, what you may have just experienced, unless you know me too well and saw this coming, is called a gestalt shift. I was talking politics, religion, and theology when I told you about a Jew who hit me in the head with a bat and then paused. In the silence, you had to give meaning to the facts. But when you learned that David was my best buddy in fourth grade, the meaning of all the facts began to change, right? That's called repentance. Maybe this entire world just needs a massive gestalt shift. This is a picture of David uh, from our high school yearbook at Heritage High School. This is a picture of Brad. I had two best friends in elementary school, David and Bradley. Both of them were Jews, so they would go to Sunday school with me, and I would go to Hebrew class with them, where we would like secretly pass the Mogad David wine, you know, underneath the, the table during the class. David, David was really into sports and super, just super smart. Brad was into beauty and bugs. And I mean, like, like uh, beauty like art. And we used to spend hours collecting bugs. I think I shared a heart with Bradley Braverman. We spent hours collecting monarch caterpillars on the milkweed plants down by my house. And we got Cecropia moth cocoons off of the uh, lilacs at Brad's house. And then we would watch and wonder as these worms would miraculously be transformed into these things of absolute beauty. Metamorphao in, in Greek. They'd be transfigured. And so Paul wrote, be not conformed to this world, but be metamorphosed, transfigured by the renewing of your mind. It's a gestalt shift. 
Well, you see, the topic is so painful for me, not because I get hit in the head with a bat, and not only because I got publicly shamed by angry Zionists, it's painful for me because I still love David and Brad. And I couldn't imagine having their blood on my hands. And if I was anti-Semitic, I would, I'd be anti-me. <laughs> the real me. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Having purified hognizo from hagios, and this word describes what uh, a priest would do when he would enter the temple and go into the inner sanctuary. He would, be, he would be sanctified. Having purified, sanctified your souls in the obedience of the truth, and Jesus is the truth, for a sincere Philadelphia brotherly love, love agapao, agape one another, earnestly from a pure heart. That's like a, a single heart. Having been begotten again, not of perishable spora, but of imperishable spora. Like we said last time, the female seed. Through the living and abiding word, logos of God. For all flesh is like grass and its glory, like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains, lasts, abides. Mino is the verb. Into the age, into the age, the age that's coming. Hebrews 13, 14, here we have no lasting, abiding, remaining city. Same verb. But we seek a city that is literally being about to be. Yet Hebrews 12, we read, you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You see, Peter and Paul talk as if we are the temple. For in the depths of every Adam, every person, behind a curtain in the Holy of Holies, God has placed his breath, neshama, ruach, his spirit, his spora, kind of like an egg. But when Christ is crucified and the gospel is preached, the curtain is ripped, and we are begotten from above by the sperma, the word of God, and then the life of God begins to flood the entire temple from the inside out, like a spring welling up inside of a person, filling the temple that is me, the, the old me, with the new me. I, the consciousness that I am, at any given moment can reside in the outer courts of space and time, or enter into the holy of holies and abide in Christ in the age to come, which is eternal life now. So anyway, the grass withers, flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains into the age. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So having put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual, the logical milk, logikos. Once the paradigm shifts, this is the only thing logical to do. Logical is what's spiritual because Jesus is the logos of God and the spirit is his spirit. Like newborn infants long for the pure logical milk. Isaiah 66 verse 10. Rejoice with Jerusalem. Be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her and joy, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast. Galatians 4.26. The juice from above is free and she's our mother. Like newborn infants, writes Peter, long for the pure logical milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. And who's salvation? Well, Jesus' name is salvation. It literally means God is salvation. Peter and Paul talk as if all these temples now come together in one living temple that is actually a man. Ha-adam. The man. And so we're to be about Building up, constructing the body of Christ, writes Paul in Ephesians. Quote, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to the full man. That's the finished man, the perfected man, the one man, the, the eschatos Adam, king of the Jews and king of all creation. Long for the pure logical milk, writes Peter, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, krestos, normally translated kind or, or pleasant. Taste. Where could we taste a nourishing fluid that would give us life and knowledge that God is good? 
as in kind. Knowledge that he gives life even when we take life. That he's not the crucifier, but he's the one that's crucified for all. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a pneumaticos house. You know, we Western Christians have come to believe that the psychicos house, which can be translated soulish, but that is things made with dust and matter, are the only things that really matter. And cannot perish. But it's the pneumaticos house. The spiritual house that is imperishable and more solid than stone. You know the resurrected Jesus had a pneumaticos body. And he could like walk through stone. Walk through stone walls. As if the walls weren't even there. And maybe they're not really even there. Maybe they're a figment of our darkened, frightened, unfaithful imagination. You yourselves are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. To sacrifice is to lose your psyche and find it. It is to bleed the life, and the, whew, the breath is in the life. The life is in the blood. This, uh, the spirit is in, in the blood. The, the life's in the blood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God to, through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, precious, and whoever believes upon him, like a stone placed on a foundation stone, will not be put to shame. So the value is for you who trust, who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the kephale gania, the head of the corner. Kephale. Ephesians 1.10. This is the plan for the fullness of time to Anna Kephaliao. Literally bring together under one Kephale, one head, all things <laughs> in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the Kephale Gunia, the head of the corner. He's the foundation of a building project that is an imperishable living temple not built by you, but constructed with you by God. The stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock, Petra, sounds kind of like Peter, huh? A rock of offense, Scandalon. And let me tell you, there is no message that pisses off the principalities and powers and the world rulers of the present darkness quite like this one. You know, um, Peter was there when Jesus cleansed the temple and he said, my father's house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. He was there when Jesus cursed the tree that wouldn't bear fruit. He was there when Jesus quoted Isaiah and the psalm saying to the scribes and the Pharisees, the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people bearing the fruit thereof. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken in pieces and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. He was there when Jesus turned and said, you see these stones? Not one will be left on top of another. He was there at the start when Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And somehow that's his body. He was there when Jesus said, you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. In other words, Peter, you're going to be with me, the cornerstone, but I will build, I will build. There is a temple that we each build using our knowledge of the good taken from the tree in the garden. And I think it's an abomination. The one that we build with our knowledge of good and evil. And there is a temple that God builds with his own life. The life that's bled into each one of us at the tree in the garden. And I think that's the new Jerusalem coming down. When we were in Israel, we toured the Temple Mount, so I took this picture. 
I was leading the tour, and I remember Susan was walking, you know, next to me, my wife, and she wouldn't just, she wouldn't leave me alone. I mean, I wish that was normally the way, but this, she wouldn't. She just was hanging all over me, grabbing my arm. I finally said, what is going on? You know, it's kind of embarrassing. People are, and it was then that she whispered in my ear so that the others couldn't hear. She said, Peter, I see snakes. They're everywhere. God sometimes gives my wife visions and words. And after years of praying with her in some just like crazy, outrageous situations, I've come to trust the words and the visions that, that he gives her and that she, she tells me. Don't always trust her with the credit card, but I trust, I trust these things. <laughs> Peter, there are snakes everywhere. And, and I remember I whispered something back to her, like, you're okay, you're okay, but do me this favor. Would you just ask God if he would show you something when we go down to the wailing wall? And, you know, you, you go, you're on the Temple Mount, then you go down to the wailing wall, the retaining wall, which the Jews, many of them, consider the most holiest thing in the land of Israel. And she said, okay, Peter, I'll ask him. When we got down to the wailing wall, I, I whispered to her. I said, do you see something? And she said, I see a lion. But she didn't seem real positive about it. And so I said, is it the lion of the tribe of Judah? Do you see Jesus? And she said, oh, no. It's definitely not Jesus. I see these little old men go up to the wall. They kiss the wall. Then they put these prayers on little pieces of paper in the cracks of the of the rock, and then when they turn around, this lion just assaults them and rips them limb from limb. Humble yourselves, writes Peter, chapter 5. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. A few weeks ago when we were on vacation, I said, honey, would you ever like to go back to that place again? Well, actually, she said to me, we were talking about church, she said, I never want to go to that place again. And I said, well, okay, but would you like to go to Galilee? And she said, oh, yeah, I would love to go to, to Galilee. Susan had three visions when we were in Israel 18 years ago. Uh, one day we were on this uh, fake old boat, and... Um, you know, they set it up so tourists could go out on the Sea of Galilee and they could show you how they fished and did all this stuff. And then we would do Bible studies out there. That's George. Susan, George went with us. He's our Arab Christian friend who led the tour with me. But she wasn't paying attention to George. Susan wasn't paying attention to me or George. She was staring out on, onto the water. Then she told me, Peter, I, I looked over to the side of the boat and right off the side of the boat, I saw these boys. Um, like a group of boys, you know, in this little old fishing boat. And they were just like laughing and fishing and, you know, being like boys. When all of a sudden, one of them looked up at me and I, I knew it was Jesus. And he said, I was happy here. That was it. I was happy here. That's always just ripped at my heart. For where is any one of us happy? Isn't it that place where we can rest? Isn't that that place where we feel like we belong? I think we call it more than a house, but a home. And what is our Lord's home? It's a temple made of living stones. Read the Revelation. It's the New Jerusalem coming down. It's, it's a temple, the new, and it's constructed with living stones. It wouldn't surprise me if the other boys in the boat were named Peter, James, John, maybe Andrew, and that they were all about the age of Peter, Har of Peter Hyatt, D David Hart, and Bradley Braverman. You know, about the time when David hit me in the head with a bat, and we would sneak the Mogan David wine in Hebrew class because... In Sunday school, all they had was grape juice. 1 Peter 2, verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now, that's really quite amazing when you think about it. As they were destined. Peter's not blaming Judas. He's not blaming Roman centurions. He's not blaming anyone. 
For they all destined to do what they did do. And what was that? Crucify our Lord. But why would God arrange for us to do what we have in fact done? Well, perhaps it's so that knowing evil, we might one day choose the good in freedom and know what it is or who he is. The love of God given to us, every good choice in us, 100% grace. But right now, don't blame the Jews. Don't blame the Palestinians. Don't even blame the Germans or the Brits. Don't blame yourself. Just thank God for the grace that is revealed to you and revealed through you. Verse 9, now you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions, epithumia of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. You know, not all passions wage war against your soul. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, epithumia, epithumesa. Literally, in lust, I have lusted to eat this meal with you. Peter, James, John, Judas. He longs to commune with you in the garden sanctuary behind the curtain in the depths of your soul, his temple. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles. Now that's fascinating, right? Do you see what he just did? He's writing to Gentiles. And he thinks they're Jews. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles beautiful. For some reason, the ESV translates kalos here as honorable, which it doesn't in most every other place, but, but it means something more like beautiful or good. When Jesus is anointed, you know, by the woman at the house of Simon the leper just before he's crucified, and all the disciples get ticked off because this just seems dishonorable, he says, leave her alone. She's done the kalos ergon, the beautiful thing. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles beautiful, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your kalos ergon, your good deeds. They, they may see your beautiful deeds and glorify doxazo, may worship, may praise God on the day of, visit, day of visitation. You know, uh, Peter was there when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He was there when Jesus stopped and he started weeping over the city, his bride, his body, his temple, and he cried, they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. What's the day of visitation? I think it's judgment day. So is judgment day over for Jerusalem? Will he ever come again? Will he ever visit again? On Good Friday to the Jews, Jesus said this, and I quote, I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, it's almost as if the kingdom of heaven is always at hand. And the king is like coming constantly, but the day your body dies, I imagine that you will see him as you've never, ever seen him before. And the brilliance of his glory and might will be utterly terrifying. And if you run from him, the only place to hide is out of darkness. Where men weep and gnash their teeth. Once Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a high mountain where he was metamorphosed, he was transformed before them. In terror, Peter blurts out, I'll build tabernacles, I'll build temples. Apparently unaware that he was the temple that God was building all along. And this voice booms out of the glory cloud above Jesus. This is my beloved son. Or I don't know exactly how it sounded, but he said, listen to him. And just the voice knocked Peter and James and John on their faces on the ground. And then Jesus walks over to them, touches them, and says, 
rise and have no fear. Or at least that's how it's recorded in scripture. But I bet to those guys it sounded something more like this. It's me. Your buddy, Peter, it's me. Remember? From the boat. We used to go fishing, Peter. Please don't be afraid. It's still me. Peter wrote, let them see your kalos ergon. That is those people that make fun of you, that despise you. Let them see your kalos ergon. So what are the good deeds that you do for which your spiritual enemies will praise God on judgment day? On judgment day, do you suppose that the radical left will look at Jesus shining in the light of his glory that would terrify anybody and they'll praise God because he looks just like you. You who enacted all that legislation against them. Is that the good work Peter's talking about? Well, that just seems unlikely to me, right? Or do you suppose that the religious right will look at Jesus and praise God because he looks just like you? You who protested in order to get them removed from the House of Representatives. That also seems unlikely to me. Or do you suppose that someone might look at Jesus and praise God that he looks just like you? For although you disagreed with them and they mocked you repeatedly, you loved them. You were kind to them. And you kept calling them your friend. You know, I never tried witnessing to David. At least not with arguments, because he's just too stinking smart. I figured he'd just run circles around me. Brad had moved away from our neighborhood by the time I got hit in the head with the bat. And I went to his bar mitzvah, I remember, but we had stopped hanging out and collecting bugs by that time. And yet I did sit next to Brad in high school jewelry making class. I, I remember trying to witness to Brad because that's what I heard I was supposed to do at youth group, you know, and, and I was kind of worried for him, but I just felt like a jackass and he didn't seem all that interested in my arguments, my apologetics. When he signed my yearbook that year, th this, is, this is what he wrote. He wrote, I wish we could have been friends longer, Peter. Sometimes I think I miss something in my childhood by moving away. I hope that you'll never forget me and always remember me as a friend. After high school, Brad experienced some pain. His parents divorced. He got caught up in a pretty wild lifestyle. It's not that he was simply homosexual or heterosexual. Brad was like anything and everything sexual. When I was in seminary in L.A., he was also in L.A. One day he called me and invited me to one of his parties saying, Peter, I have an atheist, a communist, some homosexuals. If you come, I'll have a pastor. <laughs> and I want to show you my creation, a painting of a six-foot phallus. It's incredible. I remember thinking, uh, wow. I said, Brad, I, um, I just don't think I can make it. Some of the few things I've come to deeply regret in this life. Can you imagine that party? <laughs> About nine years later, I received a call. Is this the Peter Hyatt that used to live on South Prince Circle? Yes. I'm Michelle Braverman, Brad's, Brad Braverman's little sister. And I went, Michelle, wow, it's been forever. How, how are you? Bradley died last month. He died of AIDS. Brad was gay. And he would want you to do the funeral. So I did. Along with Omar, his boyfriend, and Brenda, his girlfriend. I spoke about metamorphosis, beauty. The willow tree that we planted in his backyard, it was just a root, and it grew, turned into a tree. Then we played Brad's favorite song from the Pretenders, I'll Stand By You. Nothing you confess can make me love you less. Who does that sound like? At the reception, Michelle told me that in his final days, Brad would lie in his bed, semi-delirious, just muttering over and over again, I can't be God, I can't be God, it's, it's too hard to be God. 
Brenda told Susan that one day during that time, she asked Brad about his funeral. And then she said, Brad, have you talked to your old friend Peter? Knowing full well that Brad hadn't talked to me for years. But Brad said, oh, Peter, I talk to him every week. Maybe that was Jesus talking to Brad every week. Maybe Brad confused Jesus with the jackass he sometimes rode on. Even better, maybe Brad recognized the Jesus that he once thought was me, you know, not the arguments in me, but I mean the faith, the hope, and the love in me. Love for beauty and worms that turn into butterflies and fly away, and love for Brad. Whatever the case, I'm convinced that Bradley Braverman is a Christian. And I know that Peter Hyatt is a Jew. And on Judgment Day, when I finally get the courage to look up at the face of Jesus, I suspect that I'll say something like this. Hey, you look like Bradley Braverman and David Hart. And he'll laugh and smile and say something like, didn't ever I tell you? Didn't I ever tell you? I'm not only the king of creation. I'm the king of the Jews and Palestinians and Germans and Brits. And I'm the king of you. So on the night that he was betrayed by the Jews and the Palestinians and me and you, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat this and do do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the, the cup and said, this, this is the blood of the covenant. This is, this is the cup of the covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And so we invite you to come forward. Tear off a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and, and ingest it. And you yourself, as a living stones, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, writes Peter, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. One of those sacrifices would be worship right now. Another one of those might be actually loving an enemy with brotherly love. And if you're led, and if you want to go all out, it might even be in buying a plane ticket and going to Jerusalem. But not to crucify your enemies, but to be crucified by your enemies and for your enemies. That's how you rebuild the temple and love your neighbor. That's a gestalt shift. The temple is your neighbor. Amen. And so, Lord God, we thank you that today, November 4th, some will see you seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And we pray for those now in Jerusalem, in the Gaza Strip, in the Middle East, for those in the Ukraine, for those suffering in nursing homes, forgotten by their loved ones. We pray that when they see you, they would recognize you. Jesus, because some witness <laughs> spoke your name and was kind to them. And so they know that you can be trusted with everything. And so, Lord God, may they run into your arms. And Lord Jesus, we pray for those that are left behind that claim your name. We pray that they would not give in to the lies of the evil one 
and pray to the wrong king, worship the wrong king, but that, Lord Jesus, they would find the courage to witness to you that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be metamorphosed and fly away. And so, Lord God, in that knowledge, would you give them courage? And would you give us courage, Lord, to say the things, to speak the things that love would require? And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you like it here at the sanctuary. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I should probably tell you this, and you'll think um, that I'm, you might think I'm crazy or Susan's crazy, and that's okay. And she gets embarrassed when I say these things because she says, Peter, I don't see these things all the time. But on the 25th of June, we were having service, and not that many people were here. As you know, over the last 30 years, my congregation has shrunk significantly. <laughs> and that's sometimes kind of hard for me. But anyway, um, we did, I said at the communion, I said something like, uh, worship is a sacrifice of praise. That's what God wants. And Susan came down, we did communions, and she grabbed me like she does. She whispered in my ear, Peter, it was so cool. I looked down into the middle of our church and I saw Jesus, like in the boat. And yet he was like a grown man and the boat was just way bigger and she said, he was laughing, like these deep belly laughs. And he turned and looked at me and said, I like it here. <laughs> so I don't know what that means to you, but I hope it encourages you. Um, you make him happy. Believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.